So uh, Acts 23, that means a whole new chapter. You're turning a page in your Bible. We're moving on. Now our passage today involves a sharp confrontation between Paul and the high priest of the time, Ananias, son of Nedabias. Now Herod Chalcis, the younger brother of Herod Agrippa I, appointed Ananias to the office of high priest in A.D. 47. The marks of his ten years or so in the office were cruelty and corruption. We'll talk more about that a little bit later. I'll give it a little bit more of a biographical background as we go along in the message. Now, uh, in our passage, Paul is going to make a very strong denunciation of an Ananias and then seemingly back off the strength of his denunciation when he learns that Ananias is the high priest. So let's read the passage and um, we will, uh, and then we'll make some comments. All right, so I'm going to begin with verse 30 of chapter 22. It sort of sets the scene, but we're not going to really pay that much attention to it. But on the next day, wishing to know for certain why he had been accused by the Jews, he, uh, that's the tribune, released him and ordered the chief priests and all the council to assemble and brought Paul down and set him before them. Paul, looking intently at the council, said, Brethren, I have lived my life with a perfectly good conscience before God up to this day. The high priest Ananias commanded those standing beside him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Do you sit to try me according to the law and in violation of the law order me to be struck? But the bystanders said, Do you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I was not aware, brethren, that he was high priest, for it is written, You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. So what are we to make of this exchange? Now, on the surface, we might think that it contradicts some of the things uh, that I've taught from other passages about our relationship to authority, including our message last Sunday. Uh, Paul seems to be talking back to authority and then to back down. Uh, is, that, is that what is happening? Was he right or wrong to do what he did? What if Ananias wasn't the high priest? Would Paul's strong response be acceptable then? So part of our problem in answering these and other questions is that, is that we can't read tone from the text. It's interesting to read the various explanations that commentaries give, and some of them uh, uh, take, the, take it that he, Paul is speaking sarcastically or ironically. Well, you can't tell from the printed text. It's just, uh, that's an assumption. Uh, and then um, there is, um, uh, there's also the fact that, again, this is likely just a summary of what, what happened and all that was said. Uh, and so we don't have all the details. And so it's very difficult to discern everything here. However, we also believe what Paul said in first, uh, or 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is profitable. And this is part of scripture, so it is profitable. And we're going to look into this passage and glean what we can for instructing our own lives. So my title for the message is, Do You Revile God's High Priest? I'm taking that from verse 4. And our proposition is, The Christian Ethic Under Pressure must surrender to God's law. Now, I, as I wrote that out and I was thinking about what I was going to say, I looked at that word ethic and I thought, you know, I get feedback from our uh, Sunday school that they don't always understand what I'm talking about, which is quite, <laughs> sometimes I don't understand what I'm talking about. So, so that's, uh, that's fair enough. So I wanted to find ethic. All right, so ethic is a set of moral principles, a theory or system of moral values, the principles of conduct, governing an individual or a group. So if we think of a Christian ethic, these would be our moral values. 
It would be our, our principles of conduct as Christians, as opposed, <clears throat> as opposed to the ethic or the, or the values or, the, or the, um, uh, the principles of conduct of non-Christians. There's a Christian way of doing things. And so we could restate this. Christian, Christian morals under pressure must surrender to God's law. Now, morals is, it's a fair synonym, but to me, it doesn't encompass quite as much as ethic. But I hope that helps you to understand a little bit what I'm talking about. And of course, hopefully by the end of the message, you'll really understand what I'm talking about because uh, we're going to try to get somewhere with this. All right, so the personal ethic. The personal ethic. Paul makes a statement here in verse 1, which is his, it's sort of a statement of his own personal uh, adherence to his uh, worldview, to his view of how one should conduct himself. And he makes a claim, he identifies his claim with uh, those of others. And we'll get to that in just a second. I want to start this section with a little bit of um, a little detail that I don't want to pass by without calling it to your attention. So if you look at verse 1, it says, Paul looking intently at the council. Now, uh, this one doesn't have, this, this particular little observation doesn't have a whole lot to do with our message today. But, so you're going to have to remember this for a week because it's going to come into play next week. And if I remember, <laughs> I'll tell you about it again next week. But looking intently at the, uh, at the council, one commentator says, Paul sized up his audience. He's just looking at them, seeing, seeing who's there. And I think that it's quite likely, you, you recall, the council, now we're talking about the Sanhedrin here. This is the, the ruling council of the Jews. So the, the, the council is made up of two parties in Judaism. The Pharisees, the leading Pharisees, a lot of them are rabbis. Uh, the Sadducees, mostly priests. All right? And uh, so the Sadducees have the most clout, but the Pharisees are part of the council as well. You recall that Gamaliel, one of the, one of the Pharisees, was a part of the council. And they have competing uh, uh, values. I mean, they're all Jews. They all subscribe to the Jewish way of life, but they have competing values. And so, so Paul can probably tell sort of who's who or who belongs to which party, partly by the way they're dressed. All right, so he's looking intently at them. Uh, and another commentator says, the earnest gaze was to see if he recognized any faces that were in the body to which he apparently once belonged. Now, it's been... Uh, 27, uh, well, not quite 27, 25 years since the Damascus Road experience, right? So presumably most of those people who had been on the council when he was a very young man uh, were no longer on the council because they had passed on. But there might be some. We don't know what he was looking at them directly for, but we're going to find out something about this as we go along through this experience. All right. Uh, let's see. Now, our passage deals with the high priest and this interaction with the high priest. And, uh, uh, but we're going to see how Paul's uh, look here, his intent gaze, is going to bring this session to an end in the next part of the passage. And I, do want to, I just wanted to mention it here because it happens here and so that you'll be aware that Paul's mind is turning as he's sitting here under the gaze of all of these examiners. Now Paul makes a very comprehensive claim here. He says in verse 1, I have lived, brethren, I have lived my life with a perfectly good conscience before God up to this day. Now, um, it is... It's interesting, in our English, uh, we, they, they change the word order a little bit. Uh, and I want to call your attention to exactly how the word order appears in Greek. And this is my own translation, so it's not necessarily perfect. It's just a rough translation. So he goes, men, brethren, men and brethren, 
I, with a completely good conscience, have conducted my public life before God until this day. I, with a completely good conscience, have conducted my public life before God until this day. And he speaks about his conscience as something almost outside of himself, somewhat personified, as if it is, uh, it is, he's bringing his conscience up as his witness for his good conduct. Now, he's well aware that his conscience cannot justify him. None of us can be justified by our conscience. We uh, might say, well, I, I don't know that I have done anything wrong. Well, uh, maybe we're telling the truth in that or not. But, but our conscience, if we say our conscience doesn't condemn us in anything that we've done over the last you know, you know, five minutes or the last year or the last you know, 10 years, you know, that would be a bit of a stretch. Most of us say, well, our conscience has condemned us at a time or two. But Paul is saying here that he is not his conscience. He's lifting up his conscience as a witness that he has not, he has not done anything in his public life that before God, and so he's invoking God, and he's invoking God's standards. He says, to this day, and he is at this point in his life, at least in his 50s, maybe into his 60s now. All right? And so he, this is a pretty comprehensive claim. He's making a very bold appeal uh, based on the testimony of his clear conscience. And he uses a term here, I have lived my life. This means his conduct as a citizen. It's an, un it's an unusual word. I translated it with this term, my public life. Now, the word is Greek, and it's connected with politics. It has the same root. We, have, we get the word politics as a Greek word. It comes from Greek. And they had a word for public living. So it, you would be, I mean, I guess we have sort of a word in English called politicking. But that's, that's doing politics. That's doing, you know, you're running for office or you're, 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 trying, you're campaigning for some cause. That's politicking. Well, this word has the idea of living in public, because for the Greeks, you, everybody, if you're a citizen, you're in the polis, you're in the city, and you're going to live a public life. Well, the Jews also had a very, uh, uh, had a sense of, the, of a public life that a Jew would live. And I have, I should have probably put this on the screen, but I have a long quote, a fairly long quote, uh, that describes this word. It says, The Israelites had a particularly vivid awareness of their place in their people's tradition and law and of what they called the, uh, they give this Greek word, this political life, living as a citizen, which leads to personal behavior that is conformed to the common law, a nuance of public life. So you may recall Jesus condemning the Pharisees for their much praying in public. And of course, you, as you study the Gospels and as you read uh, literature about the first century, you know that the Jews had, there were very many parts of their regular daily life that was regulated by the Old Testament law, or at least their understanding of the Old Testament law, and especially the Sabbath keeping. And so when we have uh, for example, Jesus healing the man in the synagogue on the Sabbath. They're all uh, sort of, uh, there's this intake of breath, a little bit of a shock because, you know, he's, is he working on the Sabbath? We all have that sense. You see, that's the public life. Everybody knows what, you know, amongst the Jews, what you're supposed to do, how you're supposed to act in so many contexts of life. There's this, this public way of living. And so in this sense, it's in this sense that Paul proclaims before the Sanhedrin, I have lived before God with a, a clear conscience observing the laws of the divine polity. All right, the divine um, uh, political unit, if you want to put it that way. Now, Paul is going to make similar claims on a couple of other occasions. In, to Felix in Acts 24, he says, in view of this, I also do my best to maintain always a blameless conscience before both God and man. 
Right? So he'll talk about his blamelessness. He also will talk about that later on in his letter to the Philippians. Philippians 3.6, As to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. Paul is quite um, definite in his claim to have lived a blameless life. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, the Jewish law dominated Jewish life. The Pharisees in Judah especially emphasized a whole life commitment to the law. And all Jews, even if not Pharisees, found their lives dominated by these requirements. Now, as he makes this, uh, this, is a, this is possibly Luke's summation of what Paul has said. We don't know how long Paul spoke on this occasion. But he stands before them and he makes, and what we have is this brief statement, I, Brethren, I have lived my life with a perfectly good conscience before God up to this day. It sort of sounds like, as it's written to us, as an introductory statement. But it could be a summary statement of something larger that he said. Now, one commentator makes this observation. Such a remark was itself something of a provocation. If Paul's life as a Christian left him in complete innocence before God, then the Sanhedrin members who did not share his commitment to Christ were the guilty parties. And so, let's put it this way. Here he is. He's, he is known to be out of step with Judaism. Right? He's one who has traveled amongst the Gentiles. He's one who's known to be preaching this Christ, this Messiah, this Jesus. And, and he is saying to these Jews who are living the Jewish life, brethren, I, my conscience, gives, uh, I have lived with a clear conscience before God, under the law of God, until this day. The implication is, you aren't. Okay, you aren't. That's the implication. And so that's why it can be seen as a bit of a challenge. All right, so that's the personal ethic. Paul is saying, I am living, I am living as a good citizen of God's polity, of God's city. And, and I have been to this very day. All right, so that's the challenge, or that's his statement. Now, the abusive incident. I've called this blow and blow back. Okay, all right. So, so, um, the high priest commanded those standing beside him to strike him on the mouth. Now, that's kind of extreme. Now, we don't have, we're, the high priest isn't quoted, and nor is the description of the blow. Now, whether the blow actually fell or not, we're not told. That's not relevant, really. Uh, but the action is in keeping of what we know of the historical character of Ananias. So here's where we're going to talk about Ananias and give you a bit of his biography. First, a few quotes from commentaries. First of all, uh, let's see, F.F. F. Bruce says, Ananias brought no credit to the sacred office. Right? Ananias brought no credit to the sacred office. Another one says, Ananias had a reputation for being insolent and quick-tempered. All right, so that we see here. And then another one, Tom Cospel says, Josephus painted Ananias as a despicable person. All right, so what do we mean by that? Well, as I mentioned, he was appointed by Herod Chalcis, who is, who is one of the uh, sons of Herod the Great. Uh, he, was, uh, he was the brother of Herod Agrippa. Uh, or I guess he'd be grandsons of Herod the Great, but he's the brother of Herod Agrippa the uh, first. He held office, this Ananias held office for 11 or 12 years, uh, and the date of this hearing, as Paul is under trial, is A.D. 57. Within a year or two, Ananias will no longer be high priest. Okay. Now, Josephus, Josephus, excuse me, Josephus tells how his servants, Ananias' servants, went to the threshing floors of the temple to seize the ties that ought to have gone to the common priests. Right, so, so there was, as the ties, ties would come in the form of cash, but it would also come in the form of 
grain and other offerings. And so there would be a threshing floor. And, and these were to be the portions for the, the lower class of priests. Well, he would just go in there, send his agents in there, and seize it for himself and enrich himself that way. He was summoned to Rome five years earlier than this incident to answer charges of corruption. But he was, re, re, uh, but he was cleared and restored by the emperor Claudius. All right, put back into office. Now, Claudius was uh, notoriously corrupt himself. So he probably, you know, you know, there's honor among thieves, I guess, at least amongst these two. Uh, he was very wealthy and very influential, even after he was deposed from, from the office of high priest. And he used violence and even assassination to get his own way. Uh, and he had a very pro-Roman policy. Uh, so he was very much, you see the relationship with Claudius. If Claudius puts him back in office, you know that there's some kind of, uh, there's some kind of close relationship. Perhaps it was cemented by cash, but regardless, there was, he was very pro-Roman. He knew which side his bread was buttered on. All right. So then Paul's response, verse 3. God is going to strike you. you, you know, Ananias says, strike him on the mouth. He says, God is going to strike you, you whited wall. All right. That seems pretty extreme, doesn't it? All right. And you say, wait a minute. He just said, I've lived. Wait a minute. I have lived my life with a perfectly good conscience before God to this day. Here's his first slip, is it? Is that what's going on? Well, let's think about this. Okay, so, so when the war... Um, now, it's interesting. Well, he says, God is going to strike you. Now, this is, this is a prophecy. Now, uh, nine years later, the war with Rome would break out. Okay, so the... Jews would rebel, and eventually, and this is A.D. 66, and then in A.D. 70, the Romans would destroy Jerusalem. Well, in A.D. 66, the insurgents, those who were rebelling against Rome, captured Ananias and put him to death. And so God's blow did fall on him. And uh, he, he, well, he was removed from office to start with. And then his life was removed from him. And so everybody comments on that. I mean, uh, he, is, he is struck. It might not be immediately, but he is struck. And uh, it's interesting. I've, I, I've observed instances. There was a man I knew or heard of who had uh, done something uh, that, uh, that was antagonistic towards Christians. And another person uh, strongly rebuked, publicly rebuked this man for it and, uh, and uh, called on God to, to uh, smite him. Well, he got, the man who was made the outburst had a lot of criticism, but a few months later, the other fellow was removed from office. So God does honor statements like this. There is a precedent here uh, in Paul's circumstance for a statement against someone who uh, is abusing his position and, uh, and the prophecy that comes as a result. I wouldn't certainly just go around willy-nilly saying such things, but anyway. Then his insult. What does that mean? You whitewash wall. This is the only time this term is used in the New Testament. There's a similar term uh, used by Jesus in Matthew 23, 27. You might recall it when we when we hear this, the, a whitewashed tomb, right? So Paul or Jesus was calling the Pharisees whitewashed tombs, right? And what that referred to, the tomb, of course, is full of dead men's bones. But what the Jews would do is they would paint it with whitewash, with plaster, so that the graves would appear, appear startlingly white, so that people wouldn't in, inadvertently uh, become unclean by, by coming into contact with the, uh, with the tomb and with the dead bodies inside. And he would, and so they, uh, the whitewash gave the tomb a, a pure appearance. But inside, Jesus says, you are dead men's bones. That's what he's saying about the Pharisees. You're unclean. But that's not what Paul is saying here. This term seems to be related to Ezekiel 
13, 10 through 12. I'm going to read that to you now. It, Ezekiel says, It is definitely because they have misled my people by saying peace when there is no peace. And when anyone builds a wall, behold, they plaster it over with whitewash. So tell those who plaster it over with whitewash that it will fall. A flooding rain will come, and you, O hailstones, will fall, and a violent wind will break out. Behold, when the wall has fallen, will you not be asked, where is the plaster with which you plastered it? Now, the picture of this is that the, that the wall, that the wood of the wall itself is rotten. Right? It's, it's just rotten wood. And the only thing holding it together is the whitewash, is the plaster. Now, it's, uh, last uh, year I was working on, uh, I noticed I had a little bit of rot in some of the uh, posts on the fence going down to our suite. And it was interesting to notice, I started, I wonder how much rot there is here. started digging with my screwdriver. Pretty soon half of the post has come away. The paint was holding it together. And that's what Paul is saying about this man. You are full of rottenness and you have an appearance of, of honor and civility and goodness. He says, you are a whitewashed wall. You're rotten to the core, is what he's saying to him. All right, that's, that is the point. That you seem secure, but you will fall. That's what he is saying to him. And Paul's reason is, you, the reason he says this is, you sit in judgment according to the law, and yet you break the law. So Luke, uh, Leviticus 19.15 says, You shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor, nor defer to the great, but you are to judge your neighbor fairly. And so here uh, Ananias uh, uh, calls for punishment before even the trial has even hardly commenced. And so uh, Paul rebukes him for breaking the law. You're, you're here to, to administer the law, but you, uh, but you are breaking the law as you do so. Okay, so the abusive incident, so that's the blow, is what Ananias called for. The blowback is what Paul gave. All right. Now, the crucial detail, bowing to God's law. All right, so the, the bystanders uh, point out the identity of Ananias. They say to Paul, do you revile God's high priest? Uh, and so they're challenging his strong words. They imply here that Paul's conscience should accuse him after his boast of a good conscience in verse 1. And they use the term God's high priest, literally the high priest of God. And uh, Bruce says, but the bystanders were shocked that that was no way to speak to the high priest. They do not appear to have been so shocked by Ananias' outburst, although that was no way for the high priest to speak. Okay, so, so there's a shock and, and a detail is brought up. And Paul modifies his response in verse 5. He says, I was not aware, brethren, that he was high priest. All right, so I was not aware. This raises a question. Why, Paul, were you not aware? Why didn't you know? You are in the council chamber, most likely. You are in a hearing before the council. The, pre, the chief priest chairs the council. And he may, he doesn't necessarily at all times, but he may wear distinctive garments that would mark him out as high priest. So there's no way of knowing whether he was on this occasion. So one wonders why Paul didn't recognize the high priest. And in the commentaries, I have found... Uh, they, they, various ones will list out reasons that people have given, all right? And some are better than others. The first one is, Paul didn't hear who issued the order, all right? You know, he, he heard this voice, and he immediately lashed out. And, uh, oh, I didn't, I didn't know he was a high priest, okay? Well, that one seems a little weak to me. Uh, you know, sort of like the kind of excuse that a kid would make. You know, my mother, take out the garbage and later, did you hear me? Oh, no, I never heard you, right? You know, that, doesn't, that just seems a little weak, doesn't it? Okay, that doesn't seem right. Another uh, suggestion is Paul's eyesight isn't good. And this is often said about Paul. There's various passages that seem to indicate perhaps he had an eyesight problem. Uh, and so he couldn't see who gave the order. 
Well, maybe. That one seems a little weak to me also. And then another one is, uh, or a third one, Paul reacted impulsively without thinking about the high priest's position. Well, again, that one to me, I don't see the Apostle Paul as acting without deliberation. As we study him through the scriptures, he seems to be a man unusually gifted of God. He seems to be a man in possession of himself. He's not one given to impulsive outbursts. And so that one also seems weak to me. The fourth one is that Paul is speaking ironically. I mentioned this earlier, that he's speaking sarcastically. In other words, oh, I didn't know you were the high priest by the way you were acting. You see? You're not acting like a high priest. Well, okay, we, can't, we don't know that that's his tone. I mean, I can see, I can understand the rationale, but we just don't have any way of knowing from the text that that's his tone. And so, therefore, I think it's weak as well. And so the fifth one, I'm saving the best for last, is what I think is most likely. Even so, there might be another explanation. But anyway, so here's the most likely. He was long absent from Jerusalem and wouldn't have known for certain the identity of the high priest. This high priest was appointed in A.D. 47. In A.D. 47, Paul is out on the missionary journeys. He doesn't know who the high priests are. Okay? And he's very rarely been back to Jerusalem, only for a few moments. And so I think this is possibly the answer to the question, why didn't you know? Why didn't you know he was a high priest? Well, how would he know? He hasn't been in Jerusalem for a long time. And then very, very short visits. All right. Now, the implication of the response is, I would have spoken differently because of the law, which he quotes. He says in verse 5, You shall not speak evil of a rule of your people. This comes from Exodus 22:28. You shall not curse God, nor curse a ruler of your people. So a few observations here as we come to the end of the message. When we are unjustly treated, we can make legal appeals. And... Uh, Paul is making a legal appeal. Even though he, he makes this prophetic statement, God will smite you, you whited wall. He's making a prophetic statement there. But he is also saying, how do you, notice that in uh, verse 3, how do you, do you sit to try me according to the law and in violation of the law order me to be struck? Well, that seems to me to be a legitimate question. We can call, when, when we are under uh, pressure from an official, if they are violating the law and are inconsistent with their own rules and regulations, we can appeal on the basis of those regulations. When we're unjustly treated, we can make legal appeals. The Lord Jesus himself did that. And I have a passage to show you there from John chapter 18, during the trial of our Lord Jesus uh, before the crucifixion. Why do you question me? Question those who have heard what I spoke to them. They know, not, they know what I said. When he had said this, one of the officers standing nearby struck Jesus saying, is that the way you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, if I have spoken wrongly, testify of the wrong, but if rightly, why do you strike me? Right, so he's making a similar kind of appeal. And so there's nothing wrong if an official is violating their own code, is violating their own law, or violating principles of justice. There is nothing wrong with making appeals in the proper and appropriate way. And we, I think that we can say uh, quite certainly. Now, uh, nevertheless, despite the wickedness of office holders, God expects us to respect the office. The high priest is the ruler of God's people at this time in Paul's life. The law does forbid speaking evil of the ruler. And so a couple comments from commentaries. First of all, a key point is that Paul ultimately submits himself to the law here. And then another one. Not that the focus was on the role. Now that the focus was on the role, Paul made clear that he respected the office. 
he quoted Exodus 22:28 to underscore that he did respect God's representatives in accordance with the Torah. He was a law-abiding Jew in every respect. And that brings us back to the proposition. I've given you both the proposition and the restated proposition. The Christian ethic, under pressure, must surrender to God's law. We want to follow the Bible in how we conduct ourselves in public, this public life. Uh, if we are faced with, uh, with oppression from government, we want, or anyone else, we want to act honorably according to the scriptures and I think that that overall as we work through these passages we find that the same consistent message is given to us we we have been there has been a transformation that has occurred in our lives by virtue of being born again it is quite common in our culture for the average person to speak very disrespectfully of government. And they will use terms that uh, they might be amusing, they might be humorous, they might, be, they might have a point. And in their opposition to some of the things that government says, they might be right. Uh, and our leaders aren't the leaders of a theocracy as in the Old Testament. But we aren't animated by the flesh anymore, are we? You see, we're walking in the Spirit. And so our public life, the way we live in public, needs to show that we are under the Holy Spirit of God, that we're born again. How would the Holy Spirit expect us to interact with even evil rulers. Right? If our prime minister or other officials were as evil as they could be, you might say, oh, they are. Well, <laughs> they could be a lot worse. They're not Nero. Uh, they're not anything that we read about in the scriptures, not Nebuchadnezzar. If they're as evil as they could be, how would God, how would the Holy Spirit expect us to act? Now let's translate that to our circumstance and the leaders that we do have. How does God expect us to act? I think we have a model here in the Apostle Paul. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you for this passage, which once again touches on this topic for us. Lord, I pray that as we think about our public life, that we'd, we would be a good testimony uh, for, uh, for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and a testimony of faith. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>